Uh, welcome back and uh, we are uh, continuing the text from where we left. Lady Bracknell. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is high time that Mr. Bembry made up his mind whether he was going to live or die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd. So she is of the view that uh, uh, whenever Miss uh, Aunt Augusta needs Algernon, Bembry is always suffering from disease and Algernon has this excuse. So Lady Bracknell is of the view that uh, Bembry should prepare his mind whether he should live or should die. So this is vacillating or oscillating condition in which he is living or surviving for a very long time. This should end. So, nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Ill illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I am always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice. As far as any improvement in his ailments goes, I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bembry from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season when everyone has particularly, uh, practically said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. So, she is inviting guests, she is expecting them uh, and uh, it is her last reception of the guest on Saturday. So, she is uh, asking Algernon to uh, ask his friend Bembry to prepare his mind whether to live or die and uh, also to tell him not to have such relapse or such critical condition on Saturday. So, that uh, Algernon doesn't have to go there because he would have told him in advance not to get ill on that day. So this is really humorous here. So that Algernon doesn't have to go and he can arrange music in the party of Lady Bracknell. Algernon, I'll speak to Bambri, Aunt Augusta. If he is still conscious and I think I can promise you that he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course that music is great a difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the program I've drawn out if you will kindly come into the next room for a moment. So this is an excuse to talk about the program and the music is merely an excuse by Algernon to draw the attention of Lady Becknell and take her to another room so that Jack can propose to Gwendolyn. In this way, he will be able to dine with him in the village tonight. Lady Becknell, thank you Algernon, it is very thoughtful of you. Rising and following Algernon, I am sure the program will be delightful after a few expurgation. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language and I indeed, I believe it so. Gwendolyn, will you accompany me? So here she tells a taste that she is not... Uh, into French songs, she doesn't like them, uh, but she will uh, prefer German language, which seems a respectable language. And then, in the end, she, uh, when she again looks at Gwendolyn, that she is sitting with Jack in the corner, she asks him to go or to come with him, come with her in the next room. Gwendolyn, certainly, Mama, but she doesn't move. She keeps sitting. She does say that yes, I am coming, but she is not going. Lady Becknell and Algernon go into the music room. Gwendolyn remains behind Jack. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. So, this is a way to start conversation. So, he is using a formal way to start conversation to talk about weather. Gwendolyn, please, well, pray, don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Uh, whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. Jack, I do mean something else. Gwendolyn, I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. Jack, and I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Becknell's temporary absence. So this advantage in a way that she is not here. So Jack will be able to propose to her. Gwendolyn, I would certainly advise to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room and that I have often had to speak to her about. 
so this is the uh, level of ethics in the company of those aristocrats so uh, Gavindal is talking about her mother that since she is not here so you must do whatever you want you must say whatever you want because my mother has a bad habit of coming into room without knocking or without telling so I, I have told this thing to her many times but she doesn't listen so this is how a daughter is talking about her mother so this is about uh, again a satire on those aristocratic people Jack nervously Miss Fairfax ever since I met you I have admired you more than any girl I've ever met since I met you like since I have seen you I have admired you the most Gwendoline yes I'm quite well of the, uh, aware of the fact and I often wish that in public at any rate you had been more demonstrative so this is her wish that she should be uh, uh, like uh, she should be praised and proposed publicly not privately for me you have always had an irresistible fascination even before I met you I was far from indifferent to you Jack looks at her in amazement like since Gwendolyn says that I already knew you before I met you so he is uh, amazed that how come this is possible we live as I hope you know Mr. Worthing in an age of ideals the fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits I am told and my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest there is something in the name that inspires absolute confidence the moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest I knew I was destined to love you now here there is uh, another amusing thing amusing attitude on the part of uh, those aristocrats and especially Gwendolyn now she says that I was in love with you Jack even before meeting you she doesn't know that he, his name is Jack she knows him by the name of Ernest and even before looking at him watching him meeting him when she loved Ernest when the name of Ernest was first mentioned by Arjunan to her so she was first in love with the name so name was very common in those days even the title the importance of being Ernest as a pun in it it has double meaning so second meaning goes to the name if you have a name Ernest what are the advantages of it so uh, so it uh, since it was a ridiculous and silly kind of uh, an excuse that uh, I want to love someone having name Ernest but since it was a common name in those days uh, and a good name in those days so she wanted someone uh, or a lover to be called Ernest you really love me Gwendolyn passionately darling you don't know how happy you have made me my own earnest but you don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't earnest but your name is earnest yes I know it is but supposing it was something else do you mean to say you couldn't love me then for example if my name wasn't earnest wouldn't you love me in that case glibly Ah, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation and like most metaphysical speculation has very little reference at all to the actual facts of the real life as we know them Jack personally darling to speak quite candidly I don't much care about the name of Ernest I don't like the name I don't think the name suits me at all so since his name is not Ernest his name is Jack so he's giving excuses Gwendolyn, it suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibration. So this is again something which she has imagined about the name, not about the person. That the name of Ernest is divine name. It is a musical name. It produces vibration. So all these things are her own fascinations and fancies. Uh, <coughs> well, really Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of other much nicer names I think Jack for instance is a charming name so since his name is Jack so he is referring to that name Jack no there is very little music in the name of Jack if any at all indeed it doesn't thrill it produces absolutely no vibrations I have known several Jacks and they are all without exception were more than usually plain Besides, Jack is notorious domesticity for John. 
and I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entering pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only real safe name is Ernest. So she says that the Jack name is probably the old name, stereotype name and th that name is frequently used everywhere. So she wants a name that produces thrill, that produces vibration and that name is Jack. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. Oh, I must, uh, I mean, I, we must get married at once. There's no time to be lost. So, first he says the correct thing that he wants to say. Then he changes his sentence. He says that I must get christened at once. So, christening is a sermon in Christians. When uh, a baby is born, so holy water is <coughs> sprinkled, uh, sprinkled on him. And uh, uh, a name giving ceremony is there. Uh, in which a baby is given the name. So he means to say that I must go through that ceremony again and get another name. Remember that that ceremony is once in life. That is not to be done twice. But Jack to change his name from Jack to uh, Ernest is ready to undergo that ceremony once again. And he'll prob pro probably be getting a person who will be ready to do so. Gwendolyn, married Mr. Worthing? Astounded. Yeah, well, surely, you know that I love you and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. Given I adore you. But you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. So Gwendolyn says, okay, I am ready to marry you. I adore you. I like you. But you haven't yet proposed to me. Means there is no formal uh, proposal that is given so the proposal ceremony is not held yet this is what Gwendolyn means well may I propose to you now I think it would be very it would be an admirable opportunity and to spare you any possible disappointment Mr. Worthing I think it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you Gwendolyn yes Mr. Worthing what have you got to say to me you know what I have got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Goes on his knees. Of course I will, darling. How long you will have been about it? I'm afraid you have had very little experience in how to propose. So this is again about aristocratic society that uh, men in them are uh, ex they're expert in proposing. My own one. I had never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girl friends tell me so. So, she means to say that her brother proposes to the girls for practice. Rather, he is also an aristocratic boy. And he is proposing them for the sake of fashion. For the sake of this thing that he may like them. He may have a crush on them. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They're quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that especially when there are other people present so she means to say that you should look at me and you should express your love and sentiment to me especially when there are so many people around and to lady Brecknell lady Bre the, when lady Brecknell comes she sees that uh, Ernest is uh, sitting down and proposing to Gwendolyn lady Brecknell Mr. Worthing rise from this semi recumbent posture it is most indecorous Gwendolyn, Mama, he tries to rise, she restrains him. I must beg you retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. They rise together. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his help permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on jungle as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant, as the case may be. It is hardly a matter that she should be allowed to arrange for oneself, for herself. And now I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Gwendolyn, reproachfully. Mama! Lady Bracknell. In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn goes to the door. She and Jack blow kisses to each other. Uh, behind Lady Bracknell's back. 
Lady Bracknell looks vaguely about as if she could not understand what the noise was. Finally turns around. Gwendolyn, the carriage. Gwendolyn, yes, Mama, goes out, looking back at Jack. Lady Bracknell, sitting down. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Looks in her pocket for a notebook and pencil. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. Pencil and notebook in hand. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the lady, uh, dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. So, uh, now we come to realize the fact that Lady Bracknell has arranged a complete list following the aristocratic fashion of the time and following Duchess of Bolton, who happens to be her friend. Both of them have prepared a list of young men. So, uh, this is out of fashion of that time to have a long list of suitors uh, who are waiting to be married to your daughter. So, this is uh, a list of that kind that she is holding. But she expresses that name of uh, Jack or Ernest is not in that list. So, she is uh, asking certain questions and she says that I want to ask those questions which should be asked by any affectionate mother. So, first question in this way happens to be do you smoke? So, the answer to this should be a rebuke or a scolding on the part of Lady Bracknell because smoking is not a good habit. But Lady Bracknell says, I am glad to hear it. A man should have always an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. So, according to Lady Bracknell, those who are not smoking are idle men. How old are you? 20, 29. A very good age to be married at. I always been of opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? After some hesitation, I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. So she means to say that if a person is to be married to someone, either he should be uh, well experienced in the matrimonial affairs, like uh, he should know to take care of a lady, or he should be quite novice. So he expresses that he is quite wise in that. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. So she is preferring ignorance and she is rather advocating ignorance, which is not something to be advocated. The whole story of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to the acts of violence in the gro uh, gross violence care. What is your income? Between sixty-seven and eighty thousand a year. So, uh, sorry, between seven and eighty thousand a year. So, this is his income. Lady Bracknell makes a note in a book: in land or in investment. So, that uh, she means to say that uh, do you have cash of that or you have that amount in shape of land? In investment chiefly. So, I have that in cash. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one's during one's lifetime and the duties ex exacted from one's uh, after one's death, land has ceased to be the profit of player. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. So she means to say that land is something that you need to spend money on but it gives you a social status but you cannot do anything good with having land because you cannot uh, sell it to save your dignity. Jack, I have, uh, I have a country house with some land of course attached to it about 1500 acres I believe but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact as for that I can make out the poachers are the only people who make anything of it. So, he means to say that I do have land and that is 1500 acres. So, 1500 acre is a huge land. Now, Lady Bracknell in that time is looking for a person who is suitable for her daughter and who is a good person, handsome person and who earns a lot. So, she is asking such materialistic questions. So, he happens to be uh, giving very good answers in a way that he knows everything he has everything and he is well to do person and this is what is uh, impressing upon Lady Bracknell 
and then he says that there are only people who are using my land are the trespassers who go uh, you go from one way to another using my land so I'm not making uh, a use of my land because I have other ways of income to live for Lady Bracknell a country house how many bedroom well that point can be cleared up afterwards you have a townhouse I, I hope a girl with a simple unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country so she says that Gwendolyn would not be able to live in countryside so you must be having uh, a house in town well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to the Lady Broxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like, at six months' notice. So we come to know that Jack is a well-to-do person. Uh, not only is rich and uh, a landlord, but also is having uh, a, uh, a good house in London too. Lady Broxham, I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's lady considerably advanced in years. So she's agent lady, she doesn't go out, so she's not seen in aristocratic gatherings, so Lady Bracknell has not met her. Oh, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in the Belgrave Square? 149, says Jack, shaking her head. So whenever someone is shaking head, it means a person is shaking head or moving head in negativity, or when someone is nodding head, he or she is nodding head in positivity or in yes manner. So she is uh, uh, being negative about it, uh, that unfashionable side. I thought there was something, however, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the sight? Certainly, both if necessary, I presume. So here, both of uh, them are talking about the location. So Lady Brecknell is not satisfied with the location of the house. That may be unfashionable side of London. What are your politics? Well, I'm af afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as stories. They dine with us or come in evening at any rate. Now to mat minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as misfortune. To lose both looks like careless carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in the radical papers called the Purple of Commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of aristocracy? So since he is rich enough, so Lady Brecknell is asking uh, the, uh, what was uh, his father's uh, uh, brought up? W was he uh, a person of commerce or he, wa he came from some aristocratic family? And then again, in the beginning of this uh, paragraph, she says that losing both is carelessness so this creates humor but uh, definitely one cannot uh, possibly lose the parents it is parents who lose a children if a, chi if a child is lost I'm afraid I really don't know the fact is that Lady Bracknell I said I lost my parents it would rather near to the truth that my parents seem to have lost me I don't actually know who I am by birth I was well I was found found the late Mr. Thomas Cardew an old gentleman of very charitable and kindly disposition found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to be having a first class ticket of Worthing in his pocket at that time. Worthing is placed in Sussex and it is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first class ticket for the seaside resort find you? Now the first class ticket also mentions that person was well to do, he was not a poor person. Gravely. So he's serious on it in a handbag a handbag very seriously yes lady Bracknell I was in a handbag a somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it and ordinary handbag in fact now again the ordinary handbag means that this belonged to an ordinary family in what locality did it mr. James or Thomas Cardio come across this ordinary handbag so to lady Bracknell the Handbag being ordinary or extraordinary, that also matters a lot. Jack, in the clock room at Victoria Station, it was given to him in mistake for his own. The clock room at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Worthing. I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born at any rate, bred in a handbag, where, whether it has handles or not, seems to me display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family, 
family life that reminds me one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution and I presume you know what the unfortunate moment led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a clock room at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion. Has probably indeed been used for the purpose for before now, but it would hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in a good society. So all these remarks by Lady Becknell tell us that she is more interested in the social status and the well brought up of Jack. So the money, the uh, land, uh, the land, the investments, the house, two houses of Jack, they're not ma they don't matter Lady Becknell as much as his brought up matters. May I ask you, what would you advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. So Lady Bracknell tells that she has no objection on this uh, uh, proposal, but uh, Jack should be having parents, either one parent, either father or mother, but he should have fun. Well, I don't see that I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. So, he cannot, since he cannot bring his parents now, but at least he can present the handbag in which he was found. Lady Bracknell, me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a clock room and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. So she tries to goes out. Uh, she tries to go out, and uh, she means to say that we cannot marry our daughter with a person who was found in a handbag. So handbag is no family. Lady Bracknell sweeps out in majestic indignation. Jack, good morning. Arjun from the other room strikes up the wedding march. Jack looks perfectly furious and goes to the door. For goodness sake, don't play that ghastly tone. Algy, how idiot you are. So he's playing up upon the piano. The music stops and Algernon enters cheerily. Algernon, didn't it off go all right? Old boy, you don't mean to say that Gwendolyn refused you. I think it is a way she has. She's always refusing people. I think it is most ill-natured of her that she is not accepting anyone. She refuses all the people. Oh, Gwendolyn is as right as Trevet. As far as she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. Never met such a Gorgon. So Gorgon is the name taken from Greek mythology she happens to be a monster so Jack is comparing Lady Brecknell with Gorgon the monster I don't really know what a Gorgon is like but I'm sure that Lady Brecknell is one he doesn't know what Gorgon is but he has only listened that so it might be a monster so he is comparing uh, Brecknell with her in any case she's a monster without being a myth which is rather unfair I beg your pardon, LG. I suppose I shouldn't talk to you about your aunt in that way before you. So he apologizes that he is talking about Algernon's own uh, uh, aunt in front of him. My dear old boy, I love hearing my relations abused. So this is his. Uh, this is what value Algernon gives to his relation. So he says that uh, I like it when someone is abusing my relations. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge of how to live, now the smallest instinct about when to die. So he means to say that they don't know how to live and they don't have any plans to die. They're all the time uh, on you, off to you and they're all the time following you. So he is sick of all the relatives and Lady Brecknell is one of them. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well. I want to argue about the matter you always wanted to argue about things. That is exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that I should shoot myself a pause, you don't think that there is any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, you, do you, LG? So Jack is now thinking, if Lady Bracknell is so, 
how would uh, Gwendolyn behave? So he is making asking for clarification from Arjunan that Gwendolyn may not become like her mother in future. So Arjunan gives a very good answer. All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. That uh, if all the women follow what their mother does, but men do not follow the mother. Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased and quite as true as an observation in civilized life should be. I'm sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. So he means to say that the people who are called wise are not wise enough. Those who are fools, they were better. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. Where do they talk about? The fools? Oh, about the clever people, of course. What fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being earnest in the town and Jack in the country? Jack, in a very patronizing manner. My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite sort of thing. One tells to a nice, sweet, refined late girl what extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. So this is again a paradox. You should speak true to a nice, sweet and refined girl. But he means to say that we should not speak truth with such a lady. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty and to someone else if she is plain. So Arjunan has only one way of life to look at the girl. He behaves the same. Oh, that is nonsense. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? So that extravagant Ernest, the Ernest who is always creating mess, this is what he means. Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have to get rid of him. I'll say he died in uh, Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? So here, Jack and Arjunan, they are again talking about uh, the Ernest. So why are uh, they interested in, in this subject? Rather, the question is, why is Jack interest, uh, Arjunan uh, interested in this subject? He is particularly interested in this subject because he wants to assume the role of Ernest now. Because he has heard that uh, uh, Cecily, she is interested in Ernest. So he wants to assume that name. And then he says that I'll get rid of him and I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. So apoplexy is a kind of uh, a hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage kind of disease. Arjunan, yes, but it's hereditary, my friend. It's sort of saying that runes in the families. You had much better say a swear chill. You sure that swear chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? Of course it isn't. So, Arjunan uh, means to say that you should use such a disease which is not uh, transmitting from family to family like blood pressure and sugar do. Very well done. My poor brother Ernest to be carried off suddenly in Paris by a swear chill that gets uh, rid, him off, rid, of, rid of him. So he means to say that I'll get rid of, uh, rid of uh, my brother by saying that he died of uh, pneumonia. Uh, but I thought you said that Miss Cardio was a little too much interested in your poor, old br poor brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? So Aljana is saying that since your uh, ward is interested in him, then why are you killing him? Oh, that is all right. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl. I'm glad to say she has got a capital appetite, goes long walks and pay, pays no attention to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. So Aljana is getting interested in her. I will take very good care. You never do. She is excessively pretty and she is only just 18. So here he is giving Arjunan two uh, important points about Cecily. That one, she is pretty and second, she is uh, just 18. So this is what Arjunan likes the most. Have you told Gwendolyn that you have an excessively pretty ward who is just, who is only just 18? So Arjunan is asking Jack that whether he has informed Gwendolyn of the fact that he is living with a young girl of 18 years. 
Oh, one doesn't blurt such things to the people. Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything that anything you like that half an hour after they met they'll be calling each other sister. Algernon. Women only do that when they've called each other a lot of things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want to get a table at Willie's, we really must go and dress. Do you know? It is nearly seven. Irritably. Oh, it is always nearly seven. Well, I am hungry. I never knew when you weren't. What shall we do after dinner? Go to a theatre? Oh, no. I loathe listening. Oh, let us go to club. Oh, no. I hate talking. Well, we might trot round to the Empire then at ten. Oh, no. Trot. He means to say that we should walk there. We should have a stroll. Oh, no. I can't bear looking at things. It's so silly. Well, what shall we do? Nothing. So here we get a kind of uh, uh, theater of absurd kind of thing here that uh, he is here to please himself but he doesn't know really that how to please him. He doesn't have quite inclination uh, to be going uh, in theater, in club or walking around the streets. It is awfully hard work doing nothing. However, I don't mind hard work where there is no definite object of any kind. Antelene. Lane, Miss Fairfax. So he means to say that Gwendolyn has returned. Enter Gwendolyn. Lane goes out. Gwendolyn, uh, upon my word, like how come you came? How come you have come here? So this is what Arjun is asking. Gwendolyn, Alji, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. So he is trying to pose like a beginner, uh, begin like uh, an elder. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. So she means that you are not big enough to behave like your uncles and aunts. Algernon retires to the fireplace. My own darling, Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we shall, we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect of the young is fast dying out. So this is also a paradox. So the real sentence is the old-fashioned respect of the older people is dying out. So she is like uh, creating an, uh, an, a paradoxical statement. Whatever influence I had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But although she may be, she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, that I may marry someone else and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do alter my eternal devotion to you. So here again being uh, a funny or uh, ludicrous aristocratic of that time, so she means to say that I may marry once or may marry as many times as I want, but I will keep loving you. So this is ridiculous indeed. Dear Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn, the story of your romantic origin is as related to me by Mama with unpleasant comments has naturally stirred the deeper fibers of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? Jack, the manor house, Fulton, Hertfordshire. So Algernon, who has been carefully listening, smiles to himself and writes the address on his shirt cuff, then picks up the railway guide. So this means that he wanted to meet Cecily. So he took up the railway guide to see the map and he uh, wrote the address with him. So he, he, it is saved with him. Gwendolyn, this is good postal service. I suppose I may be necessary to do something desperate uh, that of course will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. So she's asking if uh, communication through postal service is good or not because she will tell him or uh, write to him before making any decision. My own one. How long will you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn around now. Thanks, I have turned around already. You may also ring the bell so that uh, you can call Lane. You will let me see to your carriage, my own darling? Certainly. To Lane, who now enters, I'll see Miss Fairfax out. So Gwendolyn asked Algernon to call Lane to drop her out, but uh, Algernon uh, 
uh, he like uh, called Lane inside and Lane was practically inside but then Jack goes to see her off Lane pres uh, presents uh, several letters on a server to Algernon it is to be some uh, surmised that they are all bills as Algernon after looking at the envelopes tears them up so there are all bills from grocer from meat shop from the milk milk shop from uh, for the elect electricity bill or all the bills or all the grocery items bills whatever so he tears them up because he doesn't have money to pay everything a glass of sherry lane so he wants whiskey so lane is uh, going to get it tomorrow lane i'm going bumbering so he has made up his mind that tomorrow he'll be going to uh, meet cecily cardio yes sir i shall probably not be back till monday you can put up my dress clothes my smoking jacket and all the memory suits yes sir handing sherry i hope tomorrow will be a fine day lane it never is sir lane you're perfect pessimist i'll do my best to give satisfaction sir enter jake lane goes off jake there is sensible intellectual girl the only girl i ever cared for in my life Algernon is uh laughing immoderately what on earth are you amused at Algernon? oh i'm little anxious about your poor bambri that is all if you don't take care of your friend bambri will get in you into serious scrap some day i love scraps and they're all things that are never serious oh that's nonsense algy you never talk anything but nonsense nobody ever does so jack looks indignantly at him and leaves the room Algernon lights a cigarette reads his shirt cuff and smiles so here act one drops so now Algernon has planned that he will be going to meet cecily cardio so after having a dinner tonight with jack tomorrow he is planning to go to the place the address of which he has already written with him in his uh, sleeves so this was all from my side about act one uh, definitely you'll be having uh, other interesting videos and lectures and text of the place so thank you very much please uh, do justice with my effort and subscribe the channel